Hello and welcome. Namo Buddhaya. Terawan Saranai, as they say here, which means may the blessings of the Triple Gem be with you. Moving straight on with the uh, comments and questions because I only managed to cover two. One of those are very short, small one. This is from an email, so I have edited it. Uh, what would you do if you were me with a ton of trauma from childhood all the way up to now, along with the chronic pain and mental illness? I do find that meditation does bring me to a sort of stillness and peace along with reading the Buddha's teachings. Well, I'm very uh, sorry to hear of this ton of trauma and your suffering. But please know you're not alone. We, we all, as a species and all beings, are suffering to varying degrees. What is wonderful is that you find meditation brings you a sort of stillness and peace. Sort of, not sort of, it doesn't matter. Some stillness and peace from all of that dukkha, the Pali word we use for suffering, from all of that trauma is something really positive to get to know, get to appreciate and learn to enjoy more and more. Also, the reading of the Buddha's teachings is going to be very contributory to the effort you're putting in by way of meditation to its success. So assuming you are reading the Buddha's teachings, that is the suttas, the word of the Buddha, and not too much else, because there's so much else one can read, watch, listen to, one hears about, not wrong, not right, but outside of the actual word of the Buddha, the original Buddhist scriptures. That can be set aside for now until one wants to embark on a more intellectual exercise of uh, analyzing the subject. I'm talking about the practice and your question is what would I do if I were you in this situation? I would continue doing exactly as you're doing, which is in fact following the Noble Eightfold Path by practicing meditation and by developing wisdom through studying, reading, getting to understand the word of the Buddha through the suttas. You are doing all you can do. But let me assure you, even though you are experiencing a degree, a sort of, of peace and, and uh, pleasure, uh, a sort of stillness and peace, rather, you say, uh, from your meditation, this will grow. This will extend itself, this tranquility, uh, this equanimity, uh, unreactiveness unre to your suffering will extend itself into other areas of your daily activities with your continued practice in this way. So what you are doing is exactly what I would do and what I would recommend anyone does whether or not they are burdened with a huge amount of suffering or whether they are just looking for an alternative way of life. By practicing sila, keeping the precepts, by practicing meditation, samadhi, and developing wisdom through both samadhi and understanding the word of the Buddha through your studies and your, and your reading, is the Noble Eightfold Path. It's developing right view, it's developing right intentions, right speech, right actions, right livelihood, effort, mindfulness, and meditation. 
This is what the Buddha taught us. You're already experiencing the benefits of that. Just continue with what you're doing, putting in that effort. And I can assure you, your situation, especially as far as the mental side of your illness is concerned, will gradually, albeit gradually, will improve given time with this practice. So keep going in the very right direction you're going in with that. Pain also will become less significant with time and with this practice. Just keep going with what you're doing. I discovered on another video that you were once a wealthy businessman. Mind me asking what you did with all your wealth. Have you renunciated it completely? Or do you have some set aside for health emergencies? Okay, I don't remember ever saying that I was once a wealthy businessman. I was a businessman and I once had a very good income. Wealth is rather uh, uh, an intangible thing. It's relative. It's uh, someone's uh, idea of wealth, maybe another's idea of poverty in terms of the material world, in terms of monetary values. True wealth is coming through um, this practice, is developing wisdom. Uh, and is, to some extent, the health of the body. But even that we know as being very impermanent, out of our control and temporary, is not true wealth. True wealth is pe wealth is peace of mind. But just putting the semantics of the word you're using aside, I wouldn't have perhaps said maybe I'm a wealthy businessman. Maybe successful uh, is the term it says in the description on these videos, because to some extent, yes, it, in the nature of business I was doing, I was successful. People, customers returned what they wanted, they got, uh, and we all uh, were content with our business activities. So that was what I had. In terms of wealth I accumulated and savings, it wasn't very hard to get rid of that. I spent most of my income. I was uh, in uh, a position whereby I had to get rid of most of my assets through various personal changes in life circumstances, I mean namely divorce. Um, so uh, one uh, became quite used to having, then losing, then having again, then losing, and this cycle. This is very much another teaching in our lives that we learn to accept and is very much a part of our Buddhist education as well as our lifelong uh, experience in life. If we just see it as punishment and suffering, that's what it will be. But if we see it as something to learn from, that if you lose all your money, you can soon make it all back again, then you learn a lesson. If you think that's it and throw in the towel, you won't have learned anything. You'll just stay with a good degree of albeit superficial suffering. The true freedom from suffering is not clinging to that in the first place, which is where what you quite wisely say comes from renunciation. Uh, and one does to become a ordained bhikkhu, a monk, have to renounce worldly life, including your income because you no longer have that job. So this is what I renounced, the ability or the source of my material wealth, which was very transient, impermanent, because it was just a good income that I could spend very easily. So uh, in terms of assets, money, savings, I was able to give most things away. What you're not able to access, perhaps uh, most people in in some countries have maybe some forms of savings, pensions or something like that, government-based uh, investments that you cannot access. Those you just have to leave alone, but you can assign the stewardship, as we call it, or trusteeship uh, uh, to uh, a third party, to somebody else that, uh, that you, you trust and they will look after that for you and when the time comes you can ask for it to be distributed in towards a good cause, a positive cause. But we cannot take an income ourselves from say a pension or 
take lump sums or take money and use it ourselves. This is not uh, permitted. Uh, albeit it is, I think, reasonable these days, especially if, like me, you're traveling, to have some set aside, as you say, for health reasons by way of a form of insurance, so that if there are any major financial burdens as a result of serious illness, no one else will suffer the consequences of your lack of, let's say, responsibility when you could have put something in place to manage that situation should it arise. Uh, fortunately, this hasn't been the case and I've had sickness. I've been very well supported by uh, you followers, by lay people uh, locally and internationally whom have taken very good care of me uh, in many respects, uh, physically in terms of service and financially in terms of donations. So money is never something I have to think about. I never have to concern myself with. And this is the idea of that side of renunciation. As soon as you have some money, uh, one monk, fellow monk, a friend of mine that I was on doing some traveling around southern India with, uh, someone would put, put some money in these... Um, big baskets of fruit. The uh, lay people would hide money in, in the fruit so that they didn't give you the money, but it was there. And we caught, of course got to know this and he described that as uh, a nest of vipers. It's hiding amongst the fruit, these very poisonous snakes. Uh, at first I thought, really, are there snakes? And he was referring to the money, the cash, because of course as soon as we have this cash, we have interfered with that nest of vipers it will bite us. So, yes, although I wasn't wealthy, I had a good income, but it all went because I decided to move on to much better things. True wealth. <laughs> and it really is, isn't it? I wouldn't be smiling if it wasn't. I mean, this is very much uh, not a, a salubrious existence, uh, luxurious, uh, no flat sky. I saw in a shop this uh, TV. Um, new, newish, modern. I haven't seen TV for a long time, you see. Um, I didn't see it to watch the TV. I just saw it hanging on the wall in a shop. I had calls to go to this shop. Oh, we went to get this fan with a lay person. And this TV was as big as one of these walls, it seemed. And it was kind of curved and it was very flat. And I thought, wow, that's, you know, that's such a TV. Um, and I would imagine they are quite commonplace, such things. I, heavens forbid, and I only hope you're not watching me on such a thing. Um, <laughs> otherwise, I might have to get a makeup department. Who knows? <laughs> At least you're seeing uh, what, what you really get. Um, this rough old monk in his robes. <laughs> Moving on, briskly. Good to see you back, Bante. I haven't been any. Yes, I did disappear a little bit for a couple of days. And actually, yes, some of these questions are quite old. When I had some, the work was being finished on and off in here and I had some technical issues. We hope have been resolved. I've now found a way without money that my SIM cards can be topped up. That was the issue I was having. How do, we can't top our SIM cards up ourselves because we don't use money. Um, but, uh, and we can't, unless we have certain promissory notes, ask people to do things for us or ask for things. And even if you have people who have promised such, I always feel a little, um, uh, uh, I always feel a little shy of asking someone to continually top up my mobile phone. Uh, as you can imagine, it seems inappropriate. Well, what, what is he doing with it? What is he watching? Actually, it's only to upload. It uses a lot of data to upload these videos in good quality, whatever. Um, so I have to regularly update them and I have to have a couple of different SIMs depending on where I am located in order to upload them because certain places it won't upload very efficiently or quickly. And uh, so the sims themselves cost nothing, but you have to top them up. And it's very inexpensive. It's, um, 
l l you know, a, a few pounds for a month's worth of this. That, that's all. Nothing much indeed. A few pounds, few dollars, few euros, whatever. Um, but without it, I can't upload these videos. But getting them topped up was proving a little difficult. You first you have to go to a place. They will only take cash. And anyway, I found that through PayPal, which is the way some of you do donate anyway, you can do it that way, even if it's in a different country and all over the place, um, no problem at all, without having to do anything with regards to money or these kinds of things. So uh, now these phones are, uh, or SIM cards rather, data for this purpose is relatively easy to top up without money even having to be thought about again. You just pick the, the amount of package data, whatever it is, and boom, it, it does it somehow. Um, by virtue and kindness of you, because it's not coming, it's not my money. Um, although you'll notice on that PayPal account, they made me change the name back to my legal name, uh, as is on my passport, Daniel Mason. It's no secret, but it was just titled, uh, because it was a new account for just this purpose, English Buddhist Monk. But after now, what, year, two, a year and a half or so, they've, with their reviews they do annually, picked up on that and said, no, it has to be your legal name. So I had an email and had to send them identity proof because my name legally is the name on my passport. Until such a time you change your name via deed poll in my country. Uh, and I have the documentation to do that because I have my ordination certificates, but you really have to go through a lot of rigmarole. And it's not, there's no need, there's no point. I mean, I don't have to ever use any particular descriptive name um, other than in these situations of a legal nature. So that's all been sorted out um, and working very nicely. Gosh, so moving on, I mean, I haven't even answered the question yet. Firstly, two questions. Do you know Aya Brahmavara? <clears throat> no, I don't know her, but I've heard some of her talks through Insight, that, that um, YouTube channel's Insight something, Insight Meditation, or something like that it's called. Um, she's English, so I, she caught my uh, attention, and uh, she's back in England currently looking after her mother. So presumably staying in her mother's house. She's a bhikkhuni of many vasas, that's many years in the robes, um, of, of immense experience and knowledge and a good talker and practitioner, I would imagine. But I don't know her. I've not met her, haven't lived with her. We don't really get to know nuns, monks, uh, sorry, nuns, bhikkhunis, mechis, uh, Siladaras, uh, Samaneris, whatever you want to call them, female monks, female equivalents of us, um, because we don't live with them ever. Uh, we may have occasion to meet on various organized events, but they are organized events, not the occasions to have a chat and get to know how each other is practiced. We're, we're, we're celibate uh, orders and we're kept separate uh, for obvious reasons. So. We don't get the opportunity, but through their people's teachings, through their talks, their writings, um, one gets to know them that way. Just the same as you get to know uh, teachers in, in this same way. Yeah, so that, that's um, the short part of the question. I was <clears throat> on Facebook last week. I noticed my practice went down the tubes really fast and anger and stress overtook my entire being. Gosh, well, that's why monks shouldn't, anyway. I don't use uh, social media, Facebook, but face, Facebook, uh, or, um, in fact, I, this is apparently social media, but I don't use it for chatting. Even with regards to your comments, I give you a fairly brief reply so that they're acknowledged and I don't go into the chain of conversation after that. Uh, in my view, this is where this uh, anxiety, this, uh, what are you, how are you describing it, anger and stress starts to build up in, in people. They become forums for debate or more, I should say, argument, so negative debate because this is the nature of them. Um, 
a good reason not to go on Facebook again. There's your answer. Um, you don't need to. I haven't. I did have a Facebook account many years ago. Uh, I think it was closed. It takes a long time to close it. I know. I think it opened in 2011 and closed in 2013, or it took a year, so 2014, before I came on my travels. Um, so I haven't had a Facebook account for over 10 years, and uh, in that respect, I haven't missed it at all. And even with WhatsApp, which I do have to use for communication purposes, because internationally it's a common way to speak freely, uh, just with a little data as opposed to having to top up that other side of things on your phone for phone calls and texts and everybody has it except in Thailand where you have to use a similar equivalent called line um, I have those but I ignore all of the um, update status I block all of that stuff uh, because it's a distraction it's unnecessary um, I am no more inclined to send you pictures of my lunch Although I have done that in videos, of course, with arms around Pindabata, but literally pictures of my lunch, then I have any desire to see pictures of other people's lunch, which seems to be mostly what these forums, these social media uh, platforms are about, that kind of thing. So just avoid it. You don't need it. You don't need to use it. It's the sixth hindrance. Smartphones are the sixth hindrance. hindrance. Hello from UK. How long did you stay at Chitta Viveka Monastery? Oh, not long at all. I went there for some years, more or less every day, because I didn't live far away. So the only time I stayed there was on one or two occasions, I can't quite remember, a long time ago, for a few nights. When you first stay in a monastery, you can only stay a maximum of three nights. And then if you decide you want to try it a bit longer, then you can get permission to stay for a week or a few weeks. And then, even then, you have to leave and come back, and maybe you'll be granted permission to stay for a few months. It works like that. But in this interim period, I decided to go, I'd go to Thailand and try out that same thing there. Three days, three weeks, three months. And um, it went from there. So, although I was visiting every day, I was 40 minutes drive from Chitta where I lived. I didn't have to stay there all of the time. They're not, they, they, they don't have a short, they don't have a great deal of con accommodation there. I was a lay person, so um, there was no need for me to stay. It's best to keep the accommodation free for people who are coming a long distance who need to stay. But I was able to visit most days after work in the evenings and at weekends um, and that was over a period of a few years. And even last year, no, maybe the year before now, 2022 anyway, I visited there then. Um, when I was in England for visa reasons for a month, just a bit under a month, a few weeks. Um, I, of course, visited Chitta Viveka on that, that time there. But I didn't stay because there was, uh, I had other accommodation organised. Okay, I don't know what that question means. So I just, it says, uh, he ends his life with the wrong path. Um, Oh, and then I say just Suki Ho Tu, be happy. Um, that you do expand upon it. Can you imagine if all people on earth become Buddha, then what will happen? Then one day no single man will be exist in earth because of Buddha's philosophy of unmarried. So my friend, please come back to the real path, Islam, or at least Christianity, please. Well, you know, if this happens, everyone becomes a Buddha, fully awakened being, enlightened, they would be free from samsara. Firstly, free from suffering in this lifetime, uh, having attained to arahantship, and finally, in Parinibbana, if they uh, attain to complete freedom, cessation, uh, they will have no rebirth into samsara of any kind, in any realm. And therefore, if this was to happen with any way, well, everyone, it would be the ideal situation and wouldn't matter, would it? This, was, this would account for all beings. If it was just humanity, all beings would be free to live virtually in peace without interference from humanity. So this is no bad thing if that was to happen, but it's absolutely, mostly unlikely. Um, for a start, Buddhism, Buddhists make up a relatively small percentage of the world population. 
Uh, secondly, of those, only a very, very small percentage will even attain to the first stage of enlightenment, let alone arahantship. And as far as Buddhahood is concerned, this Sama Sam Buddha, a perfectly enlightened one, that is someone who's been awakened outside of the Buddha Sasana, so having not heard any Buddha or former Buddha's teachings, so independently, freely enlightened of their own accord, which is what this Buddha, Sama Sam Buddha, did. There were no Buddhist teachings for him to rely on. He had to realize the truth himself. For that to happen, there has to have been no former Buddha or to that Buddha Sasana, that religion, to have expired through enough generations and activity for it not to be of any consequence or heard of. Uh, and then a new Buddha will arise. This is why the Maitreya Buddha, the next Buddha, isn't expected for so many millennia, no, EOL, countless years, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years from now. But this Buddha Sasana should die out, it's predicted by the Buddha, after 5,000 years, through which we're halfway through. So this isn't going to happen, as you say, my friend, in, uh, uh, in, the, in the short time or in the long time. But it, to imagine it, it's a good thing. If you could imagine all the world living in peace and doing no harm. If you could just imagine all of the world keeping one of the precepts, how wonderful would that be? No killing. Or just no stealing. Or just no sexual misconduct. Or no lying. If nobody took intoxicants. Like the Muslims, they don't drink alcohol. You know, that's a heart, huge uh, percentage of the population. It's a good thing, isn't it? You don't discourage people from that. So, uh, celibacy is just for, say, for monks and not. It isn't for lay practitioners, lay Buddhists. So, the Buddha made it quite clear that in order for the Buddha Sasana to stay alive, we need monks, nuns, lay men, lay women. Because and he put rules in place that we are dependent on lay men and lay women for partly this reason. Because if all the monks disappeared themselves into uh, independence, growing their own food, being self-sufficient and living in solitude in a cave, which you could very easily do, I could very easily do, I've done it before as a lay person, independently of society, then you'd just die, no one would have heard of you, heard of the Dharma, heard of the teachings of the Buddha, and that way the Sangha wouldn't have continued long after, any time after the first generation of monks that were there, because there would have been no interaction from monks into society with the Dharma. So, this is a bit of a weird, but I feel, oh sorry, this is a bit weird, but I feel averse to jhanas. I've heard so many people say, don't worry too much about deep jhanas, so I don't. I don't think that's dharma either. I appreciate any videos you can do on this. <clears throat> yes, I keep saying I'll do a, make a video talk about jhanas, which I will do. No, I don't think it's weird talk continually about jhanas. Uh, I must say, and I'm not talking about jhanas in too much of a hurry, because maybe there are, I'm a little averse also. So maybe I'm weird to talking about these things, even stages of samadhi. We should be doing it, practicing, jhana, experiencing jhanas for ourselves. They will come. We don't need to describe them, talk about them, for hours on end. This will happen through the practice of Sila Samadhi Panya, of keeping moral virtue, meditating and developing wisdom. We will experience jhanas, ultimately enlightenment and nibbana. But if we continue to spend our lives just talking about it, and I think that's probably what you are referring to, not jhanas themselves, the experience, but all of the talk about it. Um, so that's all I can say on this subject in terms of, when you say, I don't think that's Dharma, maybe you're referring to the fact that you don't worry too deeply about jhanas. Well, I think, you know, that is Dharma. Don't, you don't need to be worrying about any such 
uh, label signposts along the way. If you're following the route from A to B, you will pass through locations. So you're following a route on a map from one city to another, you'll pass through many towns and villages and eventually reach the city you're looking to reach. But you don't need to know before you set off the name of all those towns and those villages that you will pass through. You will experience them, you will go through them. You may stop at some, enjoy them, enjoy their hospitality, enjoy their food, their restaurants, their scenery. But you will end up eventually at your uh, destination having passed through those stages, those cities, those towns and you will, and villages, and you will enjoy those experiences, but you won't stay because you have an ultimate game, uh, ultimate goal, aim to get to the city you planned to set, you set out for in the first place. Does that make sense? I hope so. <laughs> I'm in a bit off route there with my speaking. So, yes, don't worry too much about jhanas, but I will talk about them again soon. I am practicing do no harm. I saw a mosquito in my room, and as I was about to kill it, I realized the moral virtue w not to kill. The moral virtue of not to kill. Is killing it for protecting me from biting is immoral? Or should I just run mosquito away when it comes near me, which is right practice. I think you know the answer to that, otherwise you wouldn't be asking the question. If you kill any being, for whatever reason, protecting you or others, it's killing. And the first precept is not to kill. Uh, that's as simple as that. Mosquitoes, one mosquito, wow. How do you even spot one? I mean, there's, we're good at the moment, the fan's going. So, um, there can be quite a few in here. If you watch the morning chanting, you'll see them all uh, uh, landing on me, floating around in the candlelight. So, um, yeah, um, we shouldn't be killing them. So, you can use the fan. This blows them away. That's what I have. You can have a mosquito coil, which is just smoke, which they don't like, so they go away. It doesn't kill them. Um, these sprays that kill things are killing. Um, or just go blow, shoo, be careful not to, they're delicate creatures, don't bash like this, you might damage them, hurt, harm them. Also be careful with cups of coffee and things, put a, in a mosquito place, put a lid on top because they'll go into the water not realizing it's hot and it seems to harm them. By accident, it's not your fault, but you can prevent that by covering your hot drinks or any buckets of water you have around, put a lid on, uh, it stops some breeding in there which then you don't have to have the whole worry about how to get rid of the water containing eggs and all of this. But as far as the practicality of a mosquito or a few mosquitoes in your room, you know, let them be. They'll bite you. If you're in a malaria, dengue area, then you must take various necessary precautions to avoid them biting you. Mosquito nets, repellent on your skin, this kind of thing. But in an area like this where I understand, and I'm not 100% sure, but most coastal areas, which is partly why I find them good to practice. The mosquitoes are dengue and malaria free. Um, why that is, I don't know, but it's just what I heard. So they can bite away, it's just a little blood. Is 50 too old to ordain? No, 50's not, I was over 50 possibly when I ordained. Maybe in some countries there are some restrictions, of course it depends where you are, where you're looking to ordain go to the monastery you're thinking of and ask. Uh, but 50 is not. I mean, the only age restriction for ordination is at the other end. You must be at least 20 years old to ordain. You can take Pabaja, novice ordination, from any age, as long as you can, you're uh, old enough to scare a crow, which means you're old enough to get up and go, wah, and make a crow fly away. That's considered old enough to ordain in the novice ordination, Samanera, Pabaja, the first stage. But then you have to wait until you're 20 before you can take Upasampada, full ordination, to be, be a bhikkhu. So 50, no, not at all, no problem. Very good. I encouraged you to do so. 
Okay, that's a good question about Karina Niemeta Sutta, which I'm going to come back to in my next talk uh, because the answer is quite long. Um, do you ever have back pain from sleeping on a hard concrete floor? Do you use a pillow or folded up, folded up sheet robe to lay your head on? Um, no, I don't. I, I, before I started sleeping on the floor, before I took the eight precepts, which was some uh, over ten years ago now, I've been sleeping on the floor. Before that, I, I did have some back problems. Um, I was even off work for some time once because I couldn't even straighten up my back. And this was as a result of sitting in sofas, large comfy beds, office chairs, comfy car chairs, if you call seats in cars chairs, you know what I mean. Now, since sleeping on a hard floor, no problems with my back whatsoever. But we're all physiologically different. Maybe it just suits me. As far as a pillow is concerned, I don't know whether you can see, that is my sangati, my outer robe. It's a double thickness version of this which we hardly ever use, except for ceremonial purposes, only just over our shoulder. You may have seen this thick band over monk's shoulders, that's bhikkhu's shoulders, that's what that is. Um, yeah, I use that as a pillow, folded up. In the absence of that, an empty bottle, a plastic bottle of water, I find is quite useful. But that's all, that has to be with me overnight, wherever I go. I have to have my eight requisites, including that sangati and this bowl, pindapata. So they have to be with, uh, within arm's reach of wherever you sleep at night as a bhikkhu. It's one of our rules. So that if you need to go, you can go. You can take all of your requisites with you. Um, there's no packing ever necessary. If I have to leave this room now, um, to catch the next bus in five minutes or something like that. I literally pick up my bowl, yam, sangati, throw it all over my shoulder and I'm gone. Uh, there's nothing else for me to take. My eight requisites, three robes, bowl, belt, uh, razor, water filter, which I don't really have one of those, but, and uh, sewing kit for repairing any damage to our robes. Um, other than that, we, we have no real things to carry around with us. So yes, that makes for a good pillow. It's, it's rock hard solid, it's no different to a brick really, because as you see it's not padded, it's just material closely folded up, and whereas it's never unfolded, it's quite compact. But you only really need to raise your head from the ground. A book is good, but considered in a lot of places a bit disrespectful to lay your head on a book. So um, I avoid that. A brick. Uh, covered in something, obviously, a wooden brick is good. They use wooden blocks in some monasteries. Um, and they also have in monasteries, many in Thailand, these modern things that look like blocks, but they're quite soft. I don't really get on so much with these um, soft pillow things. I don't like them for a way of complication and hygiene. This is something that needs to be cleaned quite regularly. You think of all the sweat and the uh, dribble and stuff that goes into a pillow, it just stays there, doesn't it? Festering. Well, then you lay your head on that pillow at night, breathing all of that in. And if this pillow has had many occupants, then I don't really relish that idea. Frankly, I'd rather just rest my head on my arm than on somebody else's phlegm. Um, so, yeah. But now, I never get any back pain. But that's just perhaps my good fortune. Good karma. That's boasting. I just said good fortune. So, could I give some meditation instructions on letting go? How do we let go of situations or people that keep entering our minds during meditation? Situations that cause negative emotions to come up. Well, in a guided meditation, yes, I would probably do that beginning with leave everything now uh, at the front door, so to speak. You come into the meditation, you sit down on your cushion, everything that's happened up to that moment, you leave where it was, outside, in the vestibule, the porch, on the veranda, outside of the front doors. It's the past. Nothing can be changed. Leave it there. That is letting go of most of your problems by that very knowledge. But believe that knowledge as the truth. It cannot be changed, amended. 
as far as the future is concerned, it hasn't happened yet. It may not. It can wait until your time for meditation, this period of meditation you have set aside in your day, has finished. Leave it there. Bring your attention to your meditation object into this moment here and now. And this is how I would go through guided meditation in this subject of letting go. All thoughts that come in to your mental arena for examination, allow them to pass through again. Don't attach to a reaction you may have to a thought. A person, the idea of a person comes up you don't like, don't think I don't like them because, because and this, they did this. Think that's that person, maybe offer them loving kindness in your mind, but allow the thought of that person to go away. But if that fails, just replace that thought with something wholesome, something good. Loving kindness for all beings or for even for yourself, your dear ones. But bring your awareness back to the meditation object. This is meditation. It's not a particular guided meditation, that of letting go. It is what you're doing. It's the whole point to be letting go and be coming into this present moment here and now, which is timeless. And from that, for that reason, free from suffering and enjoyable by that very nature. So all that's happened, all that will happen, leave that outside of the meditation period. When I get back to doing guided meditations, this will come into that in more detail. <clears throat> Hi Bante, how does one visit you in Sri Lanka? Well, you just come, come here. Um, depends where you're coming from, I suppose, how you get here. Um, and uh, anyone's welcome to come and visit me anytime. I don't have accommodation for people. Uh, I'm not a tour guide, so I'm not going to start organizing things, but I'm very easy to find. Uh, I'm not far from, well, maybe a couple of hours on a bus from Colombo Airport, where you have to arrive to if you're flying in, um, on the coast road. But when you get here, everyone knows where I am and knows how to find me. And there's plenty, it's a country for tourism. Uh, it's a country for tourists, so there's plenty of places you can stay either very nearby or not so near, depending on your preference. So please do visit. Uh, your your um, company would be welcome and you are welcome to join me in my practice in meditation on arms round and all that I do in my very routine. And you might find boring day, but that doesn't mean you can't enjoy a little bit of that and then go off and see the other tourist sites of, of which there are many in Sri Lanka and enjoy the other tourist activities, river, boat, boat cruises and going on in the ocean, swimming and enjoying the beaches and all of this stuff. So yes, just come, please do. I'd encourage anyone to do that. Quite a few people have already so far. Okay, I think maybe the time. I've lost the question here. That's not really a question, so if I can move on to one more. That's probably a long answer. Please excuse me, as usual, unplanned. Yeah, I'll tip about putting water uh, under the fan to help with the, the heat situation, which I do appreciate, um, the, these tips. No need to do that now because, I mean, there's plenty of water. When it rains, it's on the floor, the, leaf, the roof leaks. Um, and if not, I'm walking in and out. It's raining and now coming into the rainy season. Today's hot and sunny and dry but uh, there's plenty of moisture in the air. It's become considerably cooler since this new year, which is still ongoing. Everything still seems to be shut. So how long it goes on for, I'm not sure. About a week, it seems. Now I've found my way back to the questions, I can carry on. Um, so 
Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, it, apparently you put water in front of the fan, it's like a uh, poor man's air conditioning. But uh, not necessary, there's plenty of moisture in the air already. I don't want any more. Drying these robes takes about 10 minutes, 15 minutes in the dry weather, the sun. And, but the other day when it was raining, in, on the lines in my kuti here, which I've hung on the, in the roof, um, it didn't dry, it took all day. In the end I had to do what I've often had to do, is put the robe on, <laughs> and then your body heat dries it for you. Um, so I have to get used to that. This is what happens in the um, monsoon time. So I think that's um, sufficient for today uh, because my eyes are blurring out from looking at that screen. And um, if there's something useful there, please use it. If not, then just let it go. And until next time, thank you for watching. Be happy and stay well. Suki Hotu.